B2B marketing teams rely on e-marketing media solutions to elevate their thought leadership and build meaningful relationships through exclusive webinars, guides, infographics, and more. You can head to emarketer.com slash advertise to learn more about our proven approach. So in other words, Google is making the argument that it has gotten to this market position simply because it's better. But the way it has gone about ensuring that it's the default search engine everywhere, it kind of undercuts that argument. Hey gang, it's Monday, August 12th. Paul Max and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by two gents. We start with our senior analyst who covers everything digital advertising and media based in Philadelphia. It's Max Willens. Yo. Hey, fella. Uh, we're also joined by our Vice President of Contents. Uh, he covers everything uh, digital advertising, media, and technology. He is based uh, just above New York City. It's Paul Werner. Yo, yo. Oh, a double. I thought that's how it worked. First that, person does one, the second person does two. It can be. Today's fact. The bird with the largest wingspan is? California condor. Oh, I guess a guess in there. Okay. I wasn't going to force you guys to guess, but... Um, I don't know. I've never heard of that one. Maybe. I don't think so. I think it's <laughs> hopefully not because otherwise it's wrong. But I think it's the wandering albatross at between 8 to 12 feet. So 8 feet would be the same wingspan as French basketball player Victor Wembanyama. So if, if people watch basketball, it's roughly that big, or the smallest size of their wingspan. The wandering albatross fly over the southern oceans and breed on islands just to the north of the Antarctic Circle. So now I guess that makes sense as to where that expression comes from, to have an albatross over your neck or something. Yeah. Yeah, they're big. But not yeah. as big as the flying dinosaur, the pterodactyl. They have a wingspan of up to 36 feet. So it's four times as big, which is just shy of a hang glider. So no next time you see make it. a hang glider in the sky, that's roughly the size of a pterodactyl. Which is terrifying. Also, pterodactyl spelled with a silent P at the beginning. Who knew? It's just psychological. Well played. Anyway, today's real topic. What to make of the Google antitrust ruling part one. All right, folks, in the first episode of our two-parter on the Google antitrust ruling, we'll talk about kind of initial takes to the ruling, and then we'll kind of go through how Google could be penalized. Um, but let's set the table first. Last week, a federal judge found Google's search business constitutes an illegal monopoly, a landmark ruling, and a major victory for the US government as it seeks to clamp down on big tech, writes Nicole Naria of Vox. The ruling says that the online search giant abused its dominance, stifling competition by paying device makers like Apple and Samsung tens of billions of dollars a year to ensure Google is the default search engine. It also says Google's monopoly has led to higher digital ad prices. The US District Judge Amit Mehta said, quote, Google is a monopolist and it has acted as one to maintain its monopoly, close quote, pointing out that Google enjoys a nearly 90% share of the US search market and even higher on mobile devices, according to similar web. Bing and Yahoo, for reference, have 3% each to Google's 90. Google is appealing the ruling, saying it could now be harder for people to find the search engine they prefer, meaning themselves, saying, quote, this decision recognizes that Google offers the best search engine, but concludes that we shouldn't be allowed to make it easily available, close quote. An appeal could take years. Google's sentencing, quote unquote, quote, so to speak, what penalties it might face is set for a hearing in September. Uh, Paul, I'll start with you. What's your initial take on this ruling? Well, I was expecting this decision. I was not surprised by it. And obviously, there's going to be an appeals process. It's, it's going to be very drawn out. Definitely worth noting that there is another case pending around Google's ad tech business overall. Yes. And it's hard for me to envision that if the company was basically declared a monopolist. I mean, that the judge used that word in the decision. Hard to imagine that the other case won't go the same way. So this could be a double whammy. Interesting. But I think between the fact that there's another case pending and the appeals process, and you know, we're going now into an election cycle and a lot of things can happen. So there's definitely going to be drawn out. But I think ultimately what's going to happen is Google will have to face some sort of penalty. It's funny, 
On one hand, this is completely unsurprising to Paul's point in that when you are spending literally billions of dollars to essentially crowd out any would-be competitors, that certainly looks and smells like anti-competitive behavior. But the reality is that this is also a fight over a service that is completely free, easily replaced, and does have have competitors. So in that sense, I was actually a little bit surprised that this mm-hmm. ruling came down in this direction. Really quickly, on that point, that is part of the reason that I was surprised as well, Max, because Ashley Gold of Axios said, the ruling is proof that current US antitrust law can be successfully applied to online companies born in a digital age and factors beyond customer price that convince a judge that company is acted as a monopolist. Because to your point, these services are largely, these tech services are, are by and large free. And so that's always been a sticking point with, or a, an issue with trying to apply anti-competitive law to these services. It's like, well, they're free. You know, How can we possibly be doing anything anti-competitive? Absolutely. And I personally take a, a dim view of that argument, mm-hmm. given that, you know, when the service is free, you are the product and they're, you know, Google has made hundreds of billions of dollars monetizing information that its users have supplied them. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it, but the notion that, you know, that you can use the word free in this context, I think is a little bit silly. Mm-hmm. But I think that mm-hmm. this is momentous purely from the standpoint of this is kind of something that has been, I would say, close to like a decade in the making. When you think about how hesitant regulators, attorneys general, lawmakers were to kind of intervene in or or pour any cold water on the tech sector, which, you know, has been this growth story that has gone on for so, so long. And nobody really wanted to rein it in for a whole host of reasons. But we have finally arrived at a point where digital media is sort of central enough to the way that media works, the way our lives function, that regulators and attorneys general are finally kind of have arrived at the point of saying, okay, some of this needs to get tightened up a little bit. And it's still more momentous that a a judge agreed that some of the behavior that's taken place is uh, monopolistic and Mm -hmm. and anti-competitive. Paul, you weren't surprised. Max, it sounds like you were somewhat surprised. I was was very surprised. And part of that's because, so I think Fiona Scott Morton is a professor at Yale School of Management and former chief economist at the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. She was saying, quote, what is different is a change in the temperature. These firms are not too big. We have applied the law to them and we have found that even though they're American, even though they're innovative and spend money on R&D, they can still be found liable, close quote. I mean, we've not seen a huge antitrust case since Microsoft 25 years ago. And it did have an air of, I'll use a basketball reference here, kind of an air of the NBA in the 60s. Like big tech typically wins against the government or pays very, very small fines and gets away with things. And from 1958 to 1966, the Celtics, Boston Celtics, they won eight straight championships led by Bill Russell. And victory kind of felt inevitable. And then Philly won in 67 and people went, huh. So Boston can lose. Now, granted, the Celtics went on to win the next two after that. But you get the point. It it does feel like a bit of a moment. I think you're just bitter that it wasn't the Lakers, Marcus. I'm cutting that out. (laughs) And and yes, that's true. Go on, Max. I was going to say, I agree to an extent, but we should all agree to hold our horses a little. I mean, I think it's very possible that we'll get to September and, you know, nobody is going to want to show their cards too much. And and uh, the judge, Amit Mehta, may, you know, arrive at a solution that he thinks is, is appropriate that other people will find inadequate or he'll go the other way. But I, I do think that this is sort of academic until we get to September. Mm-hmm. And really, even then, I mean, we'll talk about this more as the conversation goes on. But and Paul has alluded to this already. This is going to take a really long time. I mean, Google is going to spare no expense in mounting a legal challenge to uh, what is coming. And that means that this this could take literally years to get ironed up. Yeah. And just as a quick note, part of why I wasn't surprised is that I think this case took on a lot of steam when the amounts of money that Google is paying to the likes of Apple to be the default search engine on Apple devices, when that was revealed, it was like 20 billion a year or something. So Mm -hmm. exorbitant sums, and obviously it's paying the same to other big tech players. But I think, and our colleague, Evelyn Mitchell Wolf, made this point back in October, and I'll quote her. She said, the obvious question is, why would Google pay so much money for default status if consumers would pick its product regardless? Mm -hmm. So in other words, Google is making the argument that it has gotten to this market position simply because it's better. But the way it has gone about ensuring that it's the default search engine everywhere 
it kind of undercuts that argument. Yeah. So I saw this as a strong case, and that's why I wasn't surprised. I also think there are a lot of parallels to, I mean, to the extent that you can draw parallels to anything that happened more than 10 years ago in the mm -hmm. digital world. But, you know, there are parallels to the Standard Oil breakup. There's a similar way that Standard Oil got to the market position that it got to. So, you know, I thought the writing was on the wall for this decision. The power of defaults is an important part of this case. It was something that the judge had emphasized and Steve Law of the New York Times was noting, the government presented studies in behavioral economics from expert witness Antonio Rangel, professor of neuroscience, behavioral biology and economics at Caltech, saying that basically concluding people rarely switch from the automatic settings, even if doing so was not a daunting technical task and that the vast majority of searches were done by habit. So this is a, not a small thing, this idea that if you're the default, then you have a huge advantage. So I think that's one reason it might be difficult for them to win the appeal. The second thing is that being number one gives you a self-perpetuating advantage. More users, better data, better search algorithm, attracts more users, better data, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, it's going to be interesting to see how the appeal goes at it seems like the next Olympics is one by the time we'll get a, a decision on that. Let's talk a bit about those contracts, though, that Google was paying to people like Apple in the sum of $20 billion and, and Samsung for a slightly smaller amounts to be the default. Because how Google could be penalized, this is one of the ways, right? It, the government could rip up these existing contracts that device makers had uh, signed with Google and say, you can't do these anymore. I mean, it spent $26 billion in 2021 on exclusive agreements to be the default search engine. And if you folks think that this is a, almost a certainty, George Hay, uh, law professor at Cornell University and former chief in commerce for the Justice Department's antitrust division, said this is definitely happening. Also Herbert Hovenkamp, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Cary Law School and Wharton Business School. So that seems like it's definitely going to happen. Max, well, I mean, is that something you would agree with? And what else can you see uh, happening to Google once Judge Meta uh, hands out the penalties? Yeah, to me, this is the most likely and frankly the only realistic outcome mm. from this ruling basically one of the as you guys have already talked about a little bit the reason that this has been such a powerful you know advantage for google is that it has allowed their flywheel to spin harder and faster for a longer period of time which mm -hmm. has resulted in a pretty significant gap in terms of the user experience. People complain about the you know creep of more and more advertisements and progressively less relevant results into Google's search engine results. But uh, shortly after chat GPT got incorporated into Bing, I thought, let me shake this up. Let me just see what happens if I switch over to Bing and, and have that be my default, partly to play with chat GPT and partly just to sort of see what life is like outside of Google. And frankly, I hate it. I, it is astonishing to me how inferior a product it is as a search engine. It is, makes it very difficult for me to do my job and to do things that had become quite second nature to me mm -hmm. uh, using Google for years and years. Mm -hmm. And breaking the kind of major input into that flywheel, or at least slowing it by barring, by not only shredding the revenue sharing agreements, but barring Google from entering into further ones is probably the most realistic thing. Yeah. And I keep using the word realistic because the other remedies that I, I've seen discussed, including things like forcing Alphabet to sell Google's search engine or break it apart from mm -hmm. its advertising business, to me don't feel very realistic, starting from the simple fact that the, the price for that search engine is would likely be so astronomical that very, very few companies would even be able to entertain buying it. Yep. And the ones that I think are positioned to spend money on it would instantly put themselves into a position of inviting regulatory scrutiny on themselves. Imagine yeah. if, you know, Amazon or Apple purchased the search engine, it would instantly put them in a similar situation. So yeah. to me, the revenue sharing agreements are going to be the sort of focal point when it comes to the remedy that Judge Mehta settles on. But I would love to hear what Paul thinks about it. Paul, really quickly, I mean, on this, the part of the problem, though, is that Nicole Naria of Vox is making this point. Apple could still make Google the default search engine. You know, even if it doesn't, Google users could still go back to using something yeah. they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with. Ian Bogost of The Atlantic was writing, as happened with Microsoft, the government could win its antitrust fight against Google on paper, but lose it in practice. Yeah. That certainly could happen. And I think Max's anecdotal example about his own use of Google, it could actually be an indicator that 
yes, Google has gotten to where it has by forcing others to play, you know, play the game. But the reality is it is a very good search engine and maybe it is a better product. So that could actually impact the way the market evolves, even if there is a ruling to force changes or to, you know, to get rid of those contracts. I totally agree with Max on the potential penalty. You know, I see three scenarios, a financial penalty, which for mm. a company with a market cap of $2 trillion is always going to be insignificant. Yeah. A breakup. I mean, quickly on that, yeah. I mean, I was trying to figure out how much they might get fined. There's been a similar antitrust case in the European Union, and that resulted in what was a record $5 billion fine against Google for antitrust violations. So, Pocket change. Yeah, for a company who's making you know hundreds of billions of dollars a year, it's nothing. Right. A breakup, which is typically what has happened with Standard Oil, with Ma Bell and other companies over the years, not realistic at all. These businesses, all of the ad tech and the search and the media, like everything in the Google flywheel is totally intertwined. So breaking it up is not realistic for that reason, as well as for the reasons Max mentioned and you, Marcus, about there's not going to be a buyer that is going to be able to pick up some of the pieces. So I think the only realistic scenario is forcing changes in the company's business practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say that when you start imagining the scenarios of who might buy it and the firestorm it might kick off, it does start to get funny fairly quickly. Like imagine if uh, ByteDance bought uh, <laughs> Google's search engine and how overjoyed the you know armed forces and uh, the government would security be. committees would be about that. <laughs> or I mean, imagine if Apple bought it, how funny would that be? Instead of saying, yeah. you know, instead of yeah. spending $20 billion a year on this, we're just going to buy it. And, yeah. you know, that will be one more kind of, uh, you know, device or ecosystem lock in because they could basically say, we have the efficacy and power of this search engine, but we're not going to append the, you know, creepy tracking stuff, which has been kind of a cornerstone of our own marketing for several years, which is that Apple is a private-ish digital environment. But mm -hmm. anyway, I just wanted to point out the how quickly yeah. things can get funny if you start thinking about suitors. If you go down the list of those companies, the obvious ones you mentioned, Max, and then if you start thinking outside the box a bit, like NVIDIA, you know, Meta, mm -hmm. like any one of those companies that would pick up any pieces of a Google breakup would mm -hmm. instantly fall under the same or worse scrutiny. And actually, most of those companies are already under scrutiny. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're in a tough spot. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. We do have an example of, of this across the pond, as I mentioned, in, in the EU, in Europe. Google already offered customers a choice for the default search engine on Android this five years ago. But because of inertia, Google's share of search requests in the EU has basically stayed the same according to search engine land. And Trishla Oswal of Adweek was writing that Google introduced a search ballot screen for Android users in the EU, prompting them to select a default search engine. Following this, Opera, an EU-based browser challenging the default status of Google, saw a 164% increase in new EU users on iOS. But as platformers Casey Newton points out, this had a negligible effect on Google's market share in Europe because it's growing from such a small base, it barely moved anything. What's quite ironic is that Google could actually benefit from these contracts being ripped up and becoming illegal. Miles Cropper of the Wall Street Journal was saying, if users are given a choice screen and most select Google, it might save Google more money in payments to Apple and Samsung, being the $26 billion it paid in 2021, than it loses in search advertising. Put another way, by Jason Nathan of Inc., Google will likely remain the default for most people without having to pay for the privilege. In an effort to make the internet more fair, what the Justice Department really just did is save Google $20 billion while likely changing nothing about how the internet actually works. Well, now you're just stepping on the points I was going to make in part two of our conversation. <laughs> Sorry. All right, no need for... Max, you can skip part two. I've already <laughs> covered everything I'll just make them in a silly Sorry. voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, they could rip up the contracts. They could be a fine. They could, uh, sharing search data with competitors was one thing that got thrown out. Maybe splitting off the search business. But yeah, Google appealing the ruling it took four years to get to this point. The Department of Justice brought the case against Google in 2020. Microsoft did appeal their ruling 25 years ago, and that did work. So we'll see. We'll talk a little bit more. God knows what about, though. We already covered it, apparently. <laughs> so for, so tomorrow uh, about how this is going to affect Google and also uh, which competitors are going to benefit the most. Uh, but that's all we've got time for for today's episode. Thank you so much to Max. Always a pleasure, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you to Paul. Yo, yo. Thank you to... Sorry. 
as an outro. Uh, Stuart and Sophie, uh, podcast crew, and thanks to everyone for listening in. We hope to see you tomorrow for part two of the Google Antitrust Ruling on the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast. 